Okay, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, get started here. So, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our monthly meeting for the Minnesota Valley uh, Civil War Roundtable. Uh, we've got a, a fun a hybrid meeting today. Um, have some some folks in person, uh, and then um, uh, virtually as well. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased uh, to have uh, author and journalist uh, Eugene L. Meyer. Uh, presenting to us today about his book, uh, Five for Freedom. And uh, so uh, Gene uh, grew up uh, on the Long Island suburbs um, and he spent over three decades at uh, the Washington Post as a reporter and editor. Um, he's uh, done work for a number of magazines uh, as well as for the New York Times. Um, he's, he's done a lot. So if you have time, please uh, you know take the time to uh, learn a little bit more about him. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Gene uh, so he can uh, get into his presentation. So thanks for joining us, Gene. Okay. Well, good evening and uh, thank you, <clears throat> Leroy and the Minnesota Valley Civil Roundtable for arranging this event and for inviting me. Um, my story begins at a farm in Washington County, Maryland. Let me see if I can get that on the screen here. All right technical issue here. How do I get it on the screen? Bear with me a second. All right, can you all see that uh, farmhouse? Or only I can see it? Okay. Yeah, we could, we could see it, Gene. I think if you hit um, the arrow down there at the bottom, goes to the right. Oh, oh I see, you. slide one of 18. Okay, well, obviously we'll begin with the cover of the book uh, where you see a, a contemporary view of Harpers Ferry from above of the uh, confluence of the Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers, about 60 miles up river from Washington, DC. That really hasn't, the view hasn't changed. It was the view that Tom Jefferson described as worth the voyage across the Atlantic. And the uh, five gentlemen that you see on the cover are the, uh, the African-American soldiers in John Brown's army that you'll be hearing about. Um, but our, our story starts at a farm uh, in actually in Maryland, about five miles from Harpers Ferry. Um, and the event that uh, I'm going to describe and talk about um, occurred 162 years ago this weekend. Um, you have to think back to October 16th, 1859. It's a rainy Sunday evening when John Brown climbed into a horse-drawn wagon at the farm where he and his uh, tiny army had assembled to prepare for an assault on Harper's Ferry. His plan was to take the town, seize the federal arsenal there and the rifle works, and to incite a slave insurrection to topple the South's peculiar institution of slavery. It will ultimately fail, but many historians say it was the catalyst for the civil war that ultimately led to the abolition of slavery. In front of the wagon are two men shouldering arms. I'll give you a little overview of Harper's Ferry in 1857. This was their destination. And the arsenal, the federal arsenal was along the Potomac River and they will be crossing this railroad bridge. But in the meantime, John Brown climbs onto this wagon. In front of the wagon are its horse drawn there are two men shouldering arms. Behind are 16 more. They're wrapped in woolen shawls to warm them against the chilly damp October night. Down the dark country road they march, quote, as solemnly as in a funeral procession. And that's in fact what it was. Those words, as solemnly as in a funeral procession, were written by Osborne Perry Anderson, one of the five African-Americans with Brown that night. He was a sole survivor and wrote the only insider account. Osborne Anderson was my way into the story. Is that bridge again? So on uh, November 2000, Veterans Day weekend, um, I did a story for the Washington Post about a memorial plaque being dedicated in his honor at a cemetery in suburban Maryland uh, near uh, FedEx Field where the Washington football team plays. And uh, it was a Rather small story ran right inside the metro section and uh, many people didn't see it, uh, but it made a big impression on me. 
And uh, uh, the other, then I learned about the other four, they were John or Anthony Copeland, Shields Green, Lewis Sheridan, and Leary and Dangefield Newby. Who were they and why were they in their stories so old yet so new to so many? These men have been treated as footnotes, if at all, by historians and others captivated by the John Brown legend. They have been truly hidden figures and it was long past time that their stories were told. And that's exactly why I wrote Five for Freedom. But the story is not only about how they came together at a fateful time and place, as I said, October 1859 at Harper's Ferry. It's also about the world into which they were born and raised, their families, their lives and deaths, and the aftermaths and their legacies down through the generations to today. It's a complicated story, <clears throat> as is our history. It's always been cast in black and white, but it's never been as simple as that. It's often cast as black history, but it is also American history, and it belongs to all of us in all its messy complexity. When I left the Washington Post in 2004, I wrote a much, much longer article for Washington Post magazine about Osborne Perry Anderson. It was called Soul Survivor. It appeared in December of that year. And here you see the, uh, the picture that went along with the article. During my research, I contacted a prominent John Brown scholar named Stephen B. Oates. And I asked him, why was Anderson's story so little known? or dismissed even by historians sympathetic to John Brown. He gave me two reasons. The first was that so little was known about him. The second was racism, plain and simple. His answers did not discourage me. On the contrary, I took them as a challenge. I had learned that Anderson was close to Marianne Shad Carey, the first black female editor and publisher in North America. Now, after the, uh, after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of freed and enslaved African Americans emigrated to what was known as Canada West, essentially uh, a peninsula east of Detroit. And Marion Shad Carey and her family, they were from uh, southeastern Pennsylvania among the, the immigrants. And uh, Osborne Perry Anderson, uh, who was known to the family, uh, moved up there first to work on her uncle's farm, but he didn't really take to farming. And so he went to work for a Marion Shad's uh, newspaper, the Provincial Freeman, um, first as a, as, a, as a printer, as a sales agent, and then a printer, and he also wrote some articles. And um, I was intrigued by, by her. Uh, she was quite a, an interesting uh, and uh, uh, active lady. She was a teacher. Uh, school teacher, as well as a publisher. Um, and uh, she had taught in Trenton and Philadelphia and Wilmington. And she had been educated in, in uh, Quaker schools. Uh, she was descended from an African-American woman and a Hessian soldier that showed her that her family had nursed back to health during the French and Indian Wars. Uh, she came from a fairly well-to-do family. And um, when the war broke out, um, uh, there was still there. I mean, this is, we're jump, jumping ahead a little bit, but just to explain the connection um, that, uh, and this was after the Harpers Ferry raid, um, that she became a recruiter for the, um, for the U.S. color troops, uh, which uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, after the Emancipation Proclamation, declared that uh, could be formed, and so did Osborne Perry Anderson, and um, eventually um, she immigrated to Washington, D.C., and so did Osborne Anderson. And I thought their lives kind of paralleled each other. And, uh, um, and I was curious as to whether there was more of a relationship. Well, some of her papers are at Howard University archives. Um, so I went down, this was a few years after the magazine article, and looked at her papers. Didn't find anything about Osborne Anderson. What I found was um, a letter, or two letters, actually, she had published in Crucial Freeman. Uh, they were from another of the raiders, from John Anthony Copeland, to his family back in Oblin, Ohio, the morning of his execution. Now, I should back up a little bit and just give a quick summary of the raid. Um, Anderson, uh, uh, John Brown and his men initially took the town without much opposition on that Sunday evening. Uh, the next day, uh, a number of local militias had organized, and, uh, and it was quite a, a battle. 
um, John Brown had taken some refugees, including the grandnephew of George Washington, and uh, Brown had in some slaves, another slaveholder, and he retreated to what was the arsenal um, fire engine house, became known as John Brown's Fort. And, uh, and then he was kind of besieged by all these local militia, and then um, he, was, uh, he made some tactical mistakes. There was a train, eastbound train coming through, and he, of course, it stopped, and uh, he allowed uh, some of his hostages to go meet with their families, and then uh, as a sign of goodwill, perhaps he allowed the, uh, the train to go through when it got to Monocacy Junction, about maybe 10 miles uh, downriver, uh, the, uh, they telegraphed uh, Washington and, and uh, President Buchanan dispatched uh, uh, Marines under Colonel Robert E. Lee, Lee, who was spending the weekend in his house in Arlington, Arlington House. And uh, the, uh, the insurrection essentially ended uh, after about 36 hours when, uh, when the Marines uh, um, you know, battered their way into this engine house and they captured Brown and uh, killed two of his sons and uh, others uh, also uh, were fatally, uh, mortally wounded. And, um, and that was the end of the raid. But uh, among those who were captured was uh, John Anthony Copeland from Oberlin and uh, Shields Green, who was a um, enslaved uh, young man from the Charleston area. There's been some recent scholarship that suggests that he was uh, actually a, a freed man of color. But for years and years, uh, historians and others, including myself, believe that he was enslaved, that he escaped uh, from the plantation and boarded a, probably a cotton ship in Charleston Harbor and wound up in the, in the Northeast. But we'll get back to him in a minute. So John Anthony Copeland, um, John Brown was tried, convicted, executed December 2nd, 1859. Two weeks later, John Anthony Copeland and Shields Green, who had also been tried and convicted, uh, were to be executed. And from his jail cell, uh, John Anthony Copeland wrote a lot of letters. He had actually uh, spent a year at the Oberlin College. And um, his family was originally from North Carolina, but they had emigrated uh, in the 18, uh, 1830s. He was a carpenter, as was his father, after uh, uh, the Nat Turner slave rebellion. Uh, a lot of the slaveholding states passed these draconian laws that affected not only enslaved people, but also free people of color, his family were among them. Um, so he had the franchise until 1835, and then that was taken from him. So he and some other families formed a wagon train uh, to, and they went up to Ohio. They had to have letters of transit from respected white, white folks, most likely also slaveholders, to get through uh, uh, the, uh, you know, Kentucky and, and uh, Virginia and eventually get to Ohio, uh, they went to uh, Oberlin. Um, they were advised when they were at the, at, in the border town not to stay there because there were slave catchers. And so he and another patriarch went to scout Oberlin. They got up there. Well, they, they met some host hostility on the way. They stopped at Tannery for corrections. They said, which way to Oberlin? And, uh, you know, they were told, uh, you know, Oberlin is, doesn't exist anymore. It's fallen to a sinkhole. And so, uh, John, actually John C. Copeland, his father's name, said, well, we'll go look into the abyss. So they got there and Oakland College was the first in America to admit black people, first in America to admit women, and they couldn't believe what they saw. Um, black and white people were attending church together, going to school together, um, you know, even bur being buried together. So the families migrated there, and that's where John Anthony Copeland um, attended the, uh, the Oakland College. Uh, Lewis Sheridan Leary, his family was also in North Carolina. He had also immigrated up there and he was a harness maker and he and Copeland were acquainted and Leary would uh, be fatally shot trying to escape across the Shenandoah River. What? And he was actually wounded and then he died several hours later. So Copeland in his jail cell before he was executed wrote a letter to his family. He wrote many letters, but th this letter on December 16th um, is what I found in the provincial freeman that Marianne Shedd carried. Um, she became a carry. She married a, a man who was actually a Toronto barber named Carrie. And he was quite a bit older and she became widowed, but she kept the name. Anyway, so uh, John Anthony wrote to his family, uh, the last Sabbath with me on earth has passed away. 
I have seen declining behind me the Western mountains for the last time. Last night for the last time, I beheld the soft bright moon as it rose, casting its mellow light into my felon cell, dissipating the darkness and filtering it with that soft pleasant light which causes such thrills of joy to all those in like circumstance than myself. I'm gonna show you a picture of that. <clears throat> this morning for the last time, I beheld in the glorious sun of yesterday rising in the far east, away off in the country where our Lord Jesus Christ first proclaimed salvation to man. And now as he rises higher and high bright light takes the place of soft moonlight, I will take my pen for the last time to write to you who are bound to me by these strong ties. And the strongest that God ever instituted, the ties of blood and relationship. Dear parents, brothers and sisters, it is true that I am now in a few hours to start on a journey from which no travel returns. We shall meet in heaven where we shall not be parted by the demands of the cruel and unjust monster slavery. But think not that I am complaining for I feel reconciled to meet my fate. I pray God that his will, will be done, not mine. More. Let me tell you that it is not the mere act of having me death, which I should regret, but that such an unjust institution should exist as the one which demands my life. I beg of you, one and all, that you will not grieve about me, but that you will thank God that he spared me time to make my peace with him. And now, dear ones, attach no blame to anyone for my coming here. For not any person but myself is to blame. <clears throat> I have no antipathy against anyone. I have freed my mind of all hard feelings against every living being. And I ask all who have anything against me to do the same. And now, dear parents, brothers and sisters, I must bid you to serve your God and meet me in heaven. Dear ones, he who writes this will in a few hours be in this world no longer. Yes, these fingers which hold the pen will before today's sun has reached the meridian, have laid it aside forever, and this poor soul have taken its flight to meet its God. And now, dear ones, I must bid you that last long sad farewell. Good day, father, mother, Henry, William and Freddie, Sarah and Mary, serve you God and meet me in heaven. Your son and brother to eternity, John A. Copeland. So that was the, what that was in the newspaper I read, and, and I just it was quite emotional to, to read that letter, and uh, I had an epiphany, which was this, it was a bigger story to be told here. It couldn't be just about um, about uh, one, you know, it couldn't be, just be about Osborne Anderson. It had to be at all five, and this was born the idea of five for freedom. And so eventually, as the time went on, I uh, became more interested and did more research and got a book contract. I guess it was uh, probably in March of 2016 with a July 2017 deadline. So then I did some intensive um, work to meet my deadline, which I did. And uh, Dangerfield Newby was one of the five. And um, he illustrates really the complexity of our history. Um, his uh, father was a white man, and his mother was an enslaved woman, enslaved by somebody else in uh, Piedmont, Virginia. And, um, and they lived together as husband and wife, um, with the indulgence of, of her owner. Um, and uh, they had 11 children. Dangerfield was the oldest. And um, there came a time when Henry Newby uh, wanted to free his family. Um, so with the permission of John Fox, who was the owner of his children, essentially, <clears throat> he went to Ohio, went to uh, right across from Wheeling, West Virginia, where there was a court case in the Ohio Supreme Court that said, you know, any enslaved person that sets foot on our shores, I mean, the Ohio shores of, of the river, would therefore be free. Uh, Henry Newby could have bought their freedom, but that would have been an expensive proposition he couldn't afford to. But he did take them to Ohio. <clears throat> Dangerfield Newby, meanwhile, had uh, established an enduring union with, uh, uh, with a woman named Harriet, who was enslaved by a doctor 
Jennings in Brentsville, then the county seat of Prince William County, now location of Quantico, um, and quite a multicultural county. But at the time, it was white and black, and most of the blacks were enslaved. And uh, <clears throat> she belonged to Dr. Jennings, and they had as many as seven children. And um, and he was uh, he was falling on hard times, at least he told her that. And so he intended to sell her to children south. And the worst thing that could happen to you if you were enslaved in the Upper South is to be sold literally down the river, down the Ohio River to the cotton plantations in Louisiana, where life was much harsher. So Dangerfield was in Ohio, and he was buying his trade as a blacksmith. He was, he was trying to negotiate their uh, purchase with Dr. Jennings. He thought he had a deal, and then Dr. Jennings increased the amount. Different accounts vary. Um, but he had actually made three deposits in, in the Bank of Ohio, in Belmont, Ohio, uh, totaling $742, which in today's dollars would be something about 21000 And then uh, Dr. Jennings wanted more than that, and, uh, and he just didn't have it. So <clears throat> he was in Northeastern Ohio, in Ashtabula County, which was a hotbed of abolitionist sentiment. And there he met John Brown. And uh, John Brown was trying to recruit African-Americans to join in his ultimately fuel, uh, and at least in the short run, uh, raid on Harper's Ferry. And um, so Dangerfield knew they went to see him and attempted to uh, enlist. And Brown's initial thought was, oh, you want to get paid. And, but Newby wasn't motivated by, by, uh, by money. He was motivated by hoping that by joining Brown, he could somehow liberate his, his wife and their children. And, uh, and I want to make the point here that uh, when, when historians have talked about the black men with John Brown, if they mentioned them at all, they're always lumped together. But each has their own story. Each came to Brown for different reasons and different ways. And it's important to recognize their individuality. Uh, Dangerfield Newby, on the second day of the raid on October 17th, <clears throat> was crossing an open area trying to get to the Arsenal Fire Engine House to join Brown when he was cut down by a, a townsperson uh, who didn't have bullets, he used a six inch spike and it cut, cut across Newby's neck and he fell almost ins instantly. And uh, <clears throat> as he was dying, the townspeople gathered around and started you know, poking sticks at him and, and severed his uh, ears and, and by one account his genitals. And then they left him for the hogs. And the hogs literally rooted around his body as a little street in Harper's Ferry called Hog Alley. And with this background, the name of the street maybe has more resonance. And he lay in the sun for a day and a half um, till after the, the raid had come to its conclusion. Um, his remains and those of the other raiders were uh, carted in a wagon half mile up the Shenandoah River and they were buried in the shallow grave. Well, Harriet Newby and her children were sold out, sadly. And um, I think it's a very poignant story that had really been largely ignored in the National Museum of African American History and Culture in the National Mall in DC. It's a small plaque in the section about families being torn apart that said, uh, you are my one bright hope, Harriet Dangerfield Newby, but no context. So uh, you wouldn't know what that was about. So while um, Dangerfield was negotiating with Dr. Jennings and, and Harriet was, uh, uh, you know, deadly afraid of being sold down the river. She wrote three letters to Dangerfield Newby. And uh, he was he received them in, in Northeast Ohio. He would take them with him to Harpers Ferry. And uh, I'm going to find them here. In the first letter, they were written April 11th, April 22nd, August 16th, 1859. In the first letter, Harriet reported that Mrs. Jennings, pastor's wife, had been sick after giving birth to a baby girl. Harriet had had to stay with her day and night. Their own children were all well, she wrote. I want to see you very much. Oh, dear Dangerfield, come this fall without fail, money or no money. I want to see you so much. That is one bright hope I have before me. <clears throat> she received the letter back on April 22nd and responded the same day. I wrote in my last letter that Miss Virginia had a baby, a little girl, had to nurse her day and night. Dear Dangerfield, you cannot imagine how much I want to see you. Come as soon as you can, for nothing would give more pleasure than to see you. 
It is the greatest comfort I have is thinking of the promised time when you will be here. Oh, that blessed hour when I shall see you once more. Finally, on August 16th, Harry wrote again, right after hearing from Dangerfield, it is said master is in want of money. If so, I know not what time he may sell me. And then all my bright hopes of the future are blasted. For there has been one bright hope to cheer me in all my troubles. That is to be with you. For if I thought I should never see you, this earth, earth would have no charms for me. Do all you can for me, which I have no doubt you will. I want to see you so much. And with added urgency, she wrote, I want you to buy me as soon as possible. For if you do not get me, somebody else will. There has been one bright hope to cheer me in all my troubles. That is to be with you. One bright hope is the title of one of the chapters of the book about Dangerfield Newby, the sad story. Dangerfield would carry these letters with him to the farmhouse where Brown's raiders had assembled and prepared for their feudal assault. Of special interest to him was Article 42 of Brown's provisional constitution for the free republic he hoped to establish in the Appalachian Mountains. Ratified in May 1858 in Chatham, Ontario, it said, marriage relations shall at all times be respected and families kept together as far as possible. And broken families encouraged to unite and intelligence offices established for this purpose. You know, that when I wrote this uh, book and started giving these talks, uh, this was a very uh, current situation in the United States as uh, families were being torn apart at the border. Um, so I, I would say, you know, it happened in 1859 and it's happening today. Um, thankfully, it's not happening at the moment as far as we know. Plaintively, Dangerfield would ask John Brown when he could respond to Harriet's letter. Soon, Dangerfield, soon, Brown would tell him. Dangerfield could not foresee the future. He could still hope, but only misery lay ahead. And I told you what happened, said the uh, conclusion. But there is a little postscript, postscript um, even though there's no reference to the newbie tragedy in any specifics in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, I'm happy to report that um, a highway marker, the state highway marker memorializing Harriet and Dangerfield Newby uh, will be erected in uh, Culpeper County, Virginia in the coming weeks or months ahead. Uh, this came as a result of a fourth grade teacher in Fairfax County, Virginia, <clears throat> using the book um, as, a, as sort of a teachable moment. And her fourth graders nominated them in a statewide Black History Month contest, uh, along with four other largely forgotten African-Americans to be memorialized in highway markers. So I can, I can say that uh, Harriet and Dangerfield Newby will be hidden figures no more. All right, let's go on here. I mentioned Lewis Sheridan Leary. Uh, he was uh, kind of a devil may care character. Uh, and uh, he had recently married when uh, he recruited John Anthony Copeland. Copeland told his family he was going to teach somewhere else in Ohio. <clears throat> Leary didn't tell his wife they had a young daughter, a year old daughter, anything. He just disappeared. So it wasn't until he was mortally wounded and then died the next day that his wife learned what happened to him. Um, she would remarry um, in Oberlin uh, to a man named Charles Langston. They would move to Kansas uh, they would, with, with her daughter, with, Dange, with uh, Louis Leary, and they would have more children. And uh, Louis Leary's daughter uh, turned out would be the, the uh, the, the, the mother of um, uh, Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes. And there's a story that Langston Hughes had been given the shawl that Lewis Leary wore, you know, that night in Harpers Ferry, and he gave it to the uh, Ohio Historical Society, I believe. Shields Green, I mentioned earlier, was kind of a mystery man, and not much was known about him. <clears throat> um, although now more recent scholarship has established that that he was probably in Canada West at one time, but he found his way to the home of, um, of Frederick Douglass in Rochester. He even had a business card, he was a clothes cleaner, and he said to have been descended from African royalty. So he had a nickname, that was Emperor. And uh, there he met John Brown, who told him something of his plans. And uh, so when Brown was uh, recruiting um, African Americans for his venture, uh, he wanted to get high profile individual, and he sought to enlist 
Frederick Douglass. And uh, Douglass was uh, up in Rochester and he said, Douglass, come down and meet me in an abandoned quarry outside of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania and bring Shields Green with you. Uh, so they did, they came down they, by way of Brooklyn where uh, a minister's wife gave a donation for John Brown's cause. And uh, they met at this abandoned quarry over a weekend in August, 1859. And Brown was there with his second in command, uh, John Kagey. And they went back and forth and Brown laid out his plan. And Frederick Douglass was very skeptical. And he said, you know, you were walking into a perfect steel trap from which you will never emerge live. And when it came time to sort of, you know, make a decision, um, Douglas just said, I'm not gonna do it. Then he turned to Shields Green and said, you know, what do you wanna do Shields? And Shields said, I think I'll go with the old man. <clears throat> so he did, he went with, and went with John Brown back to uh, the farmhouse in the Harpers Ferry where he was captured. And as I said earlier, he was executed uh, along with uh, John Anthony Copeland. Uh, the uh, Medical College of Virginia, Winchester, put in a claim for their, for their remains so that the medical students could, uh, you could dissect them and learn about anatomy. Uh, Copeland's family sought to uh, have his remains returned and it seemed to be all worked out. Governor Wise of Virginia, who signed all the death warrants, uh, told uh, Copeland's father, you know, he's a black man, you can't come here, but you can send a white man to do that. So a, a, a professor from Overland College <clears throat> named uh, James Monroe, uh, arrived in Winchester and met with the president of the medical college and everything all seemed to be all arranged. And then when he went to retrieve the body the next day, he was met with students who said, uh, no, sir, you cannot have this N-word. Uh, he belongs to us. And uh, he, had, he had taken his body and sequestered in the woods somewhere. And um, Professor Monroe was advised that uh, we better just go back, uh, you know, cause too much of a ruckus. So we went back to Oberlin uh, without uh, Copeland's remains and there was a memorial service. Oberlin sort of adopted Shields Green, although there's no proof that it was ever there. So River in Oberlin, is a, there is a, a little uh, monument to the uh, to Leary, uh, Shields Green and John Copeland. Um, now Frederick Douglass was a, was a big uh, booster of, of Shields Green posthumously. And, um, in 1881, he gave a commencement address uh, to uh, the graduates of Stora College, which was founded for newly, uh, newly freed former slaves on the hill over Lucky Harvest Ferry. <clears throat> and he had, you know, lots of praise for John Brown, but he said, you know, if a monument is ever erected to John Brown and Harpers Ferry, <clears throat> there should be a prominent place on it for Shields Green. And of course, there never was a monument erected <clears throat> There was a small monument erected on Beano Railroad property to John Brown, but uh, nothing to these five men that I'm writing about. <clears throat> so fast forward to 1959, the centennial of the John Brown raid. And it was on the cusp of the Civil War centennial. Many committees were forming throughout the South. It was also on the cusp of the Civil Rights Revolution in the 1960s. <clears throat> it was a tense time. Basically, the Civil War commissioners didn't want to rock the boat. Um, the, you know, the lost cause narrative was still very much in play. Uh, John Brown was no hero in, uh, in Harpers Ferry or in uh, the West Virginia Panhandle. And uh, so how do you plan a centennial celebration with all these forces at work? Um, well, for one thing, you try to make it a commercial success. You uh, attract weekenders and you you know, you open up all the stores and you have a beard growing contest. And, you know, you reenact the capture of John Brown. And uh, National Park Service was involved. And uh, they took a lot of black and white photographs. And I reviewed them all. There wasn't one person of color uh, in any of their photographs. Uh, and of course, there was no mention of the five for freedom that I wrote about. But when John Brown was, quote, recaptured, there were a thousand people in attendance and they broke out into wild cheer. They were just so happy that this uh, fanatic, this anti this abolitionist fanatic had been recaptured. So fast forward another 50 years to 2009, sesquicentennial, and uh, the whole world had changed seemingly. The United States had its first African-American president. 
<clears throat> Harpers Ferry had its first black uh, park superintendent, it was now National Historic Park. And the Park Service folks had gone to extraordinary lengths to contact as many descendants as they could. And um, I actually did not attend this, but um, they were generous enough to give me a list of all the people they had contacted. Um, and then also I was able to look at some pictures. And of course, it was a rainy Sunday, just as it was in 1859, when they actually did then a march in reverse from Harvest Ferry to the farm five miles away. One of the descendants was a man named, At oh, there's Dangerfield Newby again, descendant from Dangerfield Newby, Ashton Robinson III. And I had to track this guy down. He actually had not attended the reunion, uh, but um, uh, he lives in a tiny little, well, up two miles off the pavement, uh, two miles from the tiny town of Cannonville, Utah, literally off the grid. And uh, both his, he was descended from Dangerfield Newby, and both his parents were African-American, had attended segregated um, Dunbar High School in DC, it was the elite high school for blacks in Washington, DC. But they, but in the forties, they married and they moved north to Connecticut and they passed for white, which was not uncommon for people to do that. And uh, <clears throat> so he and his sister grew up in Tony Western Connecticut, thinking that they were, you know, uh, not black. You know, we'd watch the, in the 60s, we would watch black people getting beaten up by, you know, Southern sheriffs and so on. Think, well, I'm glad I'm not black, right? So then in his mid 40s, his half brother, his parents had divorced. His dad had moved to California. <clears throat> his half, half brother finds in the 1920 census the letter B next to his paternal grandfather. And, you know, what does that mean? So he calls his mother back in the DC area and she had been lying to him for decades. You know, she'd said she, you know, had gone to um, Wilson Teachers College, which was a white teacher's college, but she'd gone to Miners Teachers College. And uh, he said, you know, what's this all about? I didn't want to talk about it. Finally called her back and she said, uh, call your Aunt Agnes. <clears throat> so Ashton was very generous in sharing he did all this family research to uncover his African-American family history. And this was before the internet. You know, I went to, he was living in Utah. I worked for the U.S. Agriculture Department as a hunter. He would hunt the prey, you know, coyotes that preyed on cattle and sheep kind of thing. And, uh, and he, this was before the internet, so he would go from courthouse to courthouse. He had amassed so much information about his family, tracing back to uh, the Harriet, um, Harriet Newby. And, you know, so generously shared with me. I thought, well, you know, we, we have to actually meet in person. So I think it was March of 2017, maybe. My wife and I flew out to Vegas, I guess, and then we got a rental car. And uh, we drove up to Canada, Utah. And we spent a few days with Ashton, with his wife, Ellen. <clears throat> Ashton had retired from the federal government. Ellen was a real estate photographer. It was great, great people. And I knew the story, but I wanted him to tell it, you know, face to face. So we sat in his kind of Adobe house, 1,300 square feet, looking out the window of the Bryce, you know, Bryce Park Range, 20 miles west. He's telling me the story that I just began to tell you. <clears throat> so he gets to the part where his mother said, call your Aunt Agnes. All Ashton remembered was as a child, a dark-skinned man named Rumsick, bouncing on his knee <clears throat> when he was a toddler, he asked his mother, who is Brumsey? He said, oh, he's a friend of your father's. Actually, he was his uncle, married to his Aunt Rita. All the, the, uh, the sisters were fair-skinned. Some passed and some didn't. So Ashton said, I called my Aunt Agnes. And he said, and she spilled the beans. And as he's telling me this, he starts to sob. And sob. And that brought home to me what this book was all about and why it's so important for us to understand, you know, our history, our story. So and I, I will tell you, this is a story without an ending. It's a journey that's far from completed. <clears throat> As a Park Service ranger told me, this is not a story of the past. This is a story from the past that is relevant to the present. <clears throat> we see the relevance every day in the news headlines as race and color continue to divide and define us 
in insidious, often horrific ways. White supremacist violence continues from so-called proud boys tearing down Black Lives Matter banners to white police officers fatally shooting black citizens with no remorse, remorse and almost always no consequences. With a notable exception right here in Minnesota, in the case of George Floyd, where officer Derek Chauvin was convicted and sentenced for his murder. Here's what former New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landro, white Southern, said in an interview with the New York Times. It is essential if we really want to move forward that we do so together. We cannot do that unless we deal forthrightly with the issue of race. And unless and until we do that, we're never going to reach that aspirational moment where out of many we are one. And that's the con conclusion I came to after researching and writing Five for Freedom. It may seem obvious in this time of racial reckoning, but bears repeating. In order to overcome our past, we must do more than acknowledge it. We must own it, all of it and all of us. As my colleague Michelle Morris wrote in the Washington Post, our inability to face this history is a stick in the wheel of forward progress. We find it hard to confront our past because it's so ugly, writes Ty Sidgley, author of Robbery Lee and Mia Southern is reckoning with the myth of the lost cause. But the alternative to ignoring our racist history is creating a racist future. This has become almost axiomatic since I wrote Five for Freedom, but it is a lesson that must be learned over and over again. To me, that is the essential lesson and legacy of Osborne Perry Anderson, John Anthony Copeland, Shields Green, Louis Leary, and Dangerfield Newby. They died to make us free, but the struggle continues. Thank you for listening. And I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions? Right. Uh, Bryce, do you have any questions? I know, but it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, Jean's book is available in our digital collection and we're hoping to get a physical copy as well. Um, so you can find it um, in our BiblioBoard collection online in our digital resources. And if you'd like to know how to get that, um, I can certainly help you. And um, so thank you so much, uh, Gene, for sharing with us our research, uh, your research and um, you know, the, the amazing stories of these men. And, and of course, the book goes into a lot more detail. Um, I, I enjoyed reading the book. Uh, and um, we really appreciate you joining us this evening. So thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, uh, end the, the, the Zoom call so that um, we can finish our, our meeting notes for the meeting. And so um, thanks to, to those who joined us online. Uh, and um, Gene, I'll, I'll talk to you in, uh, in just a bit. Sounds good. Thank you.